On today's episode, SpaceX is taking over America's largest spaceport, Rocket Lab's new anti-space junk system, the IM-1 lunar lander is alive, and Japan's new H-3 rocket makes it to space. This is the Space Race. One of the biggest launch pads at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station is coming up for grabs this year, and SpaceX is looking to make the sprawling facility a new home for their Starship rocket. The US Space Force is about to begin the lengthy process of certifying SpaceX for the use of Space Launch Complex 37 at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In the words of the US Department of the Air Force, the organization that runs the Space Force, this proposed action is to advance US space capabilities and provide launch and landing infrastructure necessary to launch and insert DAF payloads into space. Which means that the DAF considers the expansion of Starship launch facilities on the Florida Space Coast to be particularly important to US policy. The process itself will mostly center around an environmental impact statement, which will do a thorough study of the area around the current launch facility built on SLC-37 to ensure that the Starship launch and landing operations won't cause any serious damage to the local ecosystem. And given that the site is currently occupied by the United Launch Alliance and their Delta IV heavy rocket launch hardware, it's pretty safe to say that SpaceX won't be in much danger of a bad finding here. But the rules say that a new assessment has to be made, and so the Department of the Air Force will be leading a group of federal agencies, including the FAA, NASA, the US Coast Guard, and of course Space Force, in determining if giving SpaceX a second launch site for their Starship vehicle would result in compromising the launch capabilities of the rest of the Space Center. The first step will be to make the environmental study, a process that typically takes about a year. As part of the normal EIS activities, the public will have a chance to get involved through a comment submittal process, as well as a series of open meetings held on March 5th, 6th, and 7th of this year. This is done so that anyone living and working nearby has a chance to raise any concerns about the project before the government gets too far into the study. As we said earlier, the DAF is currently looking at SLC-37, which is currently playing host to the ULA and their heavy Delta IV rocket, but the final launch of that vehicle is due to take place in just a few weeks, after which time the ULA don't have any plans of continuing to make use of the site. However, as SLC-37 is a facility that is already seeing use, SpaceX would have to modify, reuse, or demolish the infrastructure that's already there in order to make it ready for Starship. This is also part of what the environmental study is looking at. In the case that the former ULA launchpad isn't fit for the purpose or has any other sort of issue, the DAF-led team has two alternative proposals. The first is an entirely new facility, which SpaceX will get permission to build between Complex 37 and Complex 40, where they currently launch the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. This is similar to an earlier idea for the company to build a new pad adjacent to LC-39A where an incomplete Starship launch tower is currently being built. Unfortunately, all work on this secondary pad, originally called LC-49, has stopped for some reason, leading SpaceX to move their second Florida tower to the Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas, and leading the DAF to apparently offer these alternatives instead. The final alternative for this study is no alternative, as in SpaceX will not be getting a new pad at Cape Kennedy, stop asking alternative. Obviously, this last one would not be ideal, and it would be likely that the DAF would try to find another launch site somewhere else should it end up that the Florida coast has room for only one Starship launch facility. Because that's definitely where this is going. The US military has made it clear that Starship is a priority for them, and that its success is key to their plans for several projects, not least of which being a cargo variant for use as a point-to-point -point delivery system. The DAF and its team of federal agencies are doing a lot of work to make sure that once Starship nails its next couple of test flights, it will have enough launch sites to really take advantage of its full potential. On February 18th, Japan's Astroscale began their mission to test a new method of removing space junk in Earth's orbit with a satellite that is designed to do the dangerous work of closing in on an object and cataloging it for later removal. The Active Debris Removal by Astroscale Japan, or Address J, was flown into space on top of a Rocket Lab Electron rocket from their launch facility in New Zealand. 
deploying the satellite at about 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface and into the rough location of Astroscale's target, an upper stage piece of a Japanese H-2A rocket. Address J will now take the next three to six months approaching this defunct vehicle and scanning it with a series of cameras. It will also make a series of tests for both the procedure of approaching an object like this and checking certain technologies for monitoring the debris after it has been chosen as a target for deorbit operations. This particular upper stage is 11 meters long and 4 meters in diameter and had been used to deploy the GOSAT Earth Observatory back in 2009. It's been just floating up there ever since, making it the ideal case study for the system Astroscale wants to put into action that they are calling Rendezvous and Proximity Operations. Address J is only half of this process. The inspection satellite will fly in close to the target and take measurements for later use. Then Astroscale will deploy a Rendezvous service vehicle to capture the debris with other equipment, like their previous ELSA-D satellite, which the company launched and tested in 2021. And the next mission after Address J will be a test of exactly this sort of capture device, as confirmed by Rocket Lab Director of Global Commercial Launch Services, Sandy Turdy. In a February 7th appearance at the SmallSat Symposium, Turdy also mentioned that this sort of mission simply couldn't work on a larger rideshare like what SpaceX provides, presumably because of the very specific targets involved in deorbit operations. Which makes the decision to partner with Rocket Lab a smart one, as that company has become known for its handling of missions that require very specific attention, such as the Capstone Lunar Missions in 2022. Astroscale, on the other hand, is a company built to tackle the problems of space debris, which government agencies and regulatory commissions have been starting to pay very close attention to in the last couple of years, with new laws about the allowed lifespan of orbiting equipment being just recently put into place by the FCC. Space junk is a huge problem for the safety of our missions into space, and if we don't tackle it now, it will only keep growing. The Odysseus lunar lander made by Intuitive Machines has been able to communicate with the ground team and is healthy as of the time of recording. The IM-1 mission launched Odysseus on a Falcon 9 rocket on February 15th and smoothly began its week-long journey to the moon. Barely a day after that, the lander had to perform a crucial test of its liquid methane liquid oxygen engines, snapping some selfies with a couple of its cameras just afterwards. Testing the engines was done to confirm the vehicle had the ability to perform the landing burns that will hopefully be setting the craft down on the surface of the moon on February 22nd, and having the engines light and then turn off smoothly is a very good sign for the success of that maneuver. The next big step for IM-1 will be the lunar orbit insertion burn, which will slow the lander down enough to be captured by the moon's gravity and should happen on February 21st, with their first landing opportunity to happen the next afternoon. And that's when the main purpose of IM-1 will be put to the test. The new fuel gauge hardware that uses internal antenna and radio telemetry to map where its fuel is actually floating inside its tanks in the low gravity environment. This exact issue is what tends to cause problems with accurately measuring fuel levels in other lunar landing missions like the Hakuto-R mishap. That mission also seemed to be going perfect right up until landing, so there's a lot of extra eyes on IM-1 as they try to fix this issue. Should their new fuel gauge work properly, they very well might be the first successful commercial landing on the moon and the first US vehicle to get to the lunar surface since 1972. Intuitive Machines says that they are going to be streaming the landing live on the IM-1 mission webpage, so be sure to tune in tomorrow. On February 16th, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, made their second attempt at a test flight for their new H-3 heavy lift rocket, and it was a complete success. After a two-day delay from some bad weather, the huge rocket made a perfect launch, followed by a separation, and it was at this point during the test flight almost a year ago in March 2023 that the upper stage LE-5B3 engine failed to ignite, causing the rocket to fall back down to Earth with its payload, which was a $200 million satellite called Allos-3. This time, however, the second stage engine lit up without any issues and pushed the rest of the vehicle into a 674 kilometer high orbit. Here, the team triggered the deployments of two of its payloads, an image satellite built by Canon Electronics called CESAT-1E and a small CubeSat called TIRSAT. 
H3 wasn't quite done after that and made a secondary burn to lower its orbit and then deployed a mass simulator designed to emulate Allos 3, which had been lost in their first test flight, making sure both vehicles safely burned up in the atmosphere and to demonstrate H3's ability to make a controlled deorbit. It was only the second flight, but this launch of H3 went so perfectly that it's a bit frustrating that the first test failed at the end. JAXA and H3's primary contractor Mitsubishi Heavy Industries concluded that the first flight failed after the rocket suffered some sort of electrical failure that stopped the engines from lighting after they received the command. That is about as specific as it gets, apparently, as the investigation reportedly wasn't able to find a single cause of the mishap. A short circuit in the ignition system was suggested, as was a transistor issue, and a computer failure that may have burnt out a controller somewhere along the ignition process. Whatever the reason, JAXA and Mitsubishi made sure to swap all that hardware out for new stuff before this flight, and it paid off. The H3 is the next big workhorse of the Japanese space agency, and it is designed to be cheaper than its H2A predecessor, so you can bet we'll be seeing plenty more flights in the coming years.